Good morning. Welcome. Thank you for meeting with us. Good morning. Um, I want to just jump right in and ask you to tell us what you think are the things that South Carolina needs the most and um, wh where is it we need to be and how are we going to get there? Well, Cindy, we have a leadership board right now in the governor's office. And so uh, what we see is uh, every agency that's been touched by Governor Haley is in crisis mode. The reason I decided to run for governor was I used to prosecute child abuse and neglect cases in family court in Anderson County as a young prosecutor. And I know how to fix the DSS problem. I've, I've uh, followed that uh, story with great interest. In fact, I sent Governor Haley two letters before I decided to run, asking her to replace her uh, cabinet appointee, Lillian Kohler, because it was clearly a leadership uh, crisis at uh, the DSS. Uh, 251 children died under Governor Haley's watch between 2011 and 2013. And of course, we don't know how many children have died in 2014 because the agency won't release those numbers. But my worst fears were confirmed by the Legislative Audit Council report that came out uh, this past month, which detailed all the systematic failures of the Haley administration to address these problems that we know have been around for years. Uh, the two prior Legislative Audit Council reports highlighted the, uh, the need for more caseworkers uh, to supervise uh, these children who are our most vulnerable population, those children that are in harm's way, and yet the Haley administration failed to act. And so uh, this uh, this is of great concern to me, and that will be my first priority, to see that we get leadership, particularly at DSS, uh, but also at our other state agencies that are in crisis mode. And those are, uh, include uh, DHAC, DOR, and others. Can you talk about how you go about um, making those appointments? Yes. Uh, we've seen a pattern in practice by Governor Haley of appointing crony, cronyism-type political hacks. Uh, for example, there's no reason why a lawyer should be leading the uh, Department of Health and Environmental Control. Uh, if I'm governor, I'm going to find a, a physician or health care professional to lead that agency. Uh, that's what we need. And uh, so uh, we need to make sure that we hire the, the best and the brightest to lead our state agencies and not just uh, use them as uh, a place to put uh, political appointees like Governor Haley has. The other issues that I think facing our state is we have a critical need in our state to address our crumbling roads and bridges. You know, our infrastructure is so important to recruiting new industry to South Carolina. We can't expect new industry to continue to come to our state if they don't have safe roads and bridges so they can get their raw materials in and get their finished product out to market. But more importantly is put our, uh, our citizens at risk. We have the most dangerous rural roads in the nation. And we have the highest fatality rate in the nation on our roads. They're simply not safe anymore. Uh, half of our primary and secondary roads are rated poor by the South Carolina Department of Transportation. Uh, we have um, over 1,500 bridges in South Carolina that are structurally deficient and uh, need to be repaired or replaced. And the Department of Transportation says uh, this is a $1.44 billion problem and the cost is going up. They've, they've recently revised that to say now it's closer to a $2 billion problem per year. And you know, our, our gas tax or some, the user fee on gasoline has not been adjusted for 27 years. And it was never tied to inflation. So the uh, buying for the buck that we're getting from that revenue stream has dropped uh, dramatically. Now, I don't want to increase the gas tax uh, beyond where our neighboring states are. In other words, we need, we need an adjustment, but we don't want to raise it uh, any higher than our neighboring states of Georgia and North Carolina. We have to, however, have a reliable revenue stream to meet this need, and I think the gas tax has to be on the table as we work with our legislative leadership uh, to pass uh, a funding uh, infrastructure bill. And I'll work with them, but all Governor DeHaley has done is, is threaten uh, to veto any uh, new fees or gas taxes, and that's totally irresponsible considering the, the sad uh, shape that our infrastructure is in. You know, the other issue that Governor Haley failed us on is the Port of Charleston. 
One out of every five jobs in South Carolina is dependent on the Port of Charleston. It's our gateway to the world. And yet, she cut a backroom deal with Governor Deal in Georgia, uh, allowing them to dredge the Savannah River 23 miles upstream. It allows Georgia to dump their waste on us in Jasper County uh, with environmental effects to, to the ecostructure in, in the river and put our port of Charleston at a competitive disadvantage. And that was clearly wrong. And she did it for political reasons. She went over to Georgia for a fundraiser at a law office that represented the Port of Charleston, uh, the Port of Savannah, and she sold out the Port of Charleston. Uh, and she did it behind closed doors and then came back immediately to South Carolina, flipped the votes of the uh, DHEC appointees uh, that she appointed to the, to the board uh, against the better advice of the DHEC staff. The staff was asked to leave the room, uh, and the staff had, had recommended not giving uh, Georgia a, a permit to dredge uh, Savannah River, and yet they, uh, um, it was done for political reasons and uh, to the detriment of our state and our port. I'd also like to see us expand the port at Georgetown because I think it has potential uh, to, to help uh, grow our economy and create jobs there. And by the way, if we do pass the infrastructure bill, that will create a number of jobs for our state. Uh, and I think that's left out in the conversation. When we start improving our infrastructure, there are going to be a lot of uh, unskilled and semi-skilled workers that will be back at work in South Carolina uh, rebuilding our infrastructure. The other concern that I have in uh, uh, looking at the issues that face us is that we need to grow the economy for all. You know, Governor Haley likes to talk about her job numbers, but I've traveled the state of South Carolina. I've traveled thousands of miles. I've held over 40 town halls throughout the state, and I can tell you there's so many people out there that are still hurting. There, there are lots of folks that are working two and three part-time jobs just to make ends meet. And, you know, our, our minimum wage is seven twenty-five an hour before taxes is just not a living wage. So I'd like to see us over a three-year period gradually increase the minimum wage uh, with tax credits back to small business so that we can help these folks <coughs> that are willing to work hard uh, earn a living wage to uh, support their families. Uh, we need to give them a hand up, not a handout. So uh, part of my proposal would be to, uh, to phase that in over three years and try to move up closer to $10 an hour as a, as a state minimum wage. Um, we also need to cap college tuition. You know, South Carolina has some of the highest college tuition in the nation and the highest college public tuition in the southeast. And what that does, it's limited access for the middle class uh, young people to attend college. And it's also created a hardship when they graduate because um, more than half of these young people graduate with over $30,000 in student loan debt. Now the state of Texas has already done this. They capped college tuition so that when a freshman enters a public university or college, uh, their tuition remains the same for four years. This gives the family and that student an opportunity to, to budget and plan for the, the four years without these high tuition increases each and every year. Uh, it's not a perfect uh, solution to this problem of access to college, but it at least will help them uh, as they try to begin uh, uh, their life and uh, graduating uh, so that they can afford a car, find a place to live, and hopefully uh, be a productive member of society. Uh, that, that age group, too, by the way, has a, uh, a higher unemployment rate, so all the more reason why we should try to help them ease into uh, the workforce uh, without all this uh, crushing student loan debt. Uh, the other thing I'd like to see us do when we talk about improving public education, uh, all the studies show that the best investment we can make is uh, to expand pre-K or kindergarten. You know, 57% of the kids that entered first grade in South Carolina last year had no uh, kindergarten or uh, pre-first grade uh, experience, public or private. And so unfortunately, those kids were really not ready for first grade. And all the studies show if they are not ready for first grade, they will not be successful in school 
and the high, the, the high school dropout rate for them is, is much higher. So we've got to start earlier and to, uh, to improve our long-term outcomes, uh, that is the best place to start. I know as a circuit judge, uh, so many of the young people that I had to sentence to prison for criminal convictions were high school dropouts. And so we've got to continue to try to improve our high school graduation rate. That's the key to their future so that they can find a job and become a productive member of society, become a taxpayer rather than being incarcerated where they're drained to our society. And so uh, we know that the best place to start is, is pre-K because remediation is so costly. And you know, Governor Haley claims a big victory by passing this bill that, that tests third graders to see if they're reading at grade level. Well, really, that's too late because North Carolina's tried this and they, you know what they found out in North Carolina? Half the kids in third grade were not reading at grade level. So now they're left with all these remediation costs. They've got to bring in reading coaches, they've got to send them to summer school, after class uh, reading sessions, and that's very costly. And we could use that money on the front end with pre-K and never have to go through that expensive remediation process. Uh, Governor Haley also touts, you know, her computer or technology uh, buy for some of the uh, schools. And, you know, uh, my experience is it's sometimes best to leave those de uh, decisions to the local school districts. I would have preferred that we uh, set aside the money but let the local districts make those purchases because by the time the state government goes through the procurement process, that technology is going to be already outdated before it reaches a classroom. Uh, so her, her education plan was flawed, and it will not have the impact that, uh, that, that's uh, hoped for, unfortunately. Um, well, the thing we've got to do is continue uh, to work to uh, pay our uh, classroom teachers uh, a fair wage. Uh, I know when I was a member of the General Assembly uh, from 1980 to 84, uh, we sponsored the Education Improvement Act with Governor Riley, and one of our goals was to bring teachers' salaries up to the southeastern average. And the reason that's important is we have a retention problem in South Carolina. We lost over 10,000 public school teachers last year because they become frustrated. It's, it's a very difficult job, and it, it, it's, uh, it's made even more difficult by the many standardized tests that they now have to give. And it, that takes away t instructional time that they need in the classroom. And it's also a difficult job because they end up having to pull money out of their own pockets to pay for school supplies. And, and that shouldn't happen. We've got to do a better job of supporting our teaching profession and treating them as professionals uh, so that we can retain uh, the best teachers and recruit the best teachers uh, so that our children uh, have, uh, have the benefit of, of having uh, excellent classroom teachers. We've got to set a high bar and, uh, and demand excellence. Money's not the only answer, but it, it certainly is part of the, the equation when we're trying to uh, make improvements in public education. And the final thing that I wanted to talk about was the, the need for strong ethics reform. You know, Governor Haley said that ethics reform was going to be her top priority in the legislative session. And yet when the bill worked its way through the House and then on to the Senate, she was missing in action. Actually, when the bill came up for debate, she was out of state two days during that, that critical last week of the session. And, uh, and uh, Governor Haley failed to lead on that uh, important legislation. It wasn't perfect, but it would have at least given us uh, income disclosure and I would have preferred to have had that than nothing. We've left, we're left with nothing. And Senator Shaheen voted against the bill. And so what we have, we have two career politicians, really, in, in Governor Haley and Senator Shaheen. Governor Haley, if you count her time in the House, uh, she's been there for more than a decade, and Senator Shaheen's been there for 14 years, and they failed to lead on this issue. And the reason is they're career politicians, they're control largely by their political parties and their special interests. And so that leads me to my next point, and really, we need term limits. Uh, you know, 
uh, a number of states have adopted term limits for, uh, for their legislators, and I think it's time that we seriously consider that in South Carolina. Um, I, uh, <clears throat> I also would like to see ethics reform legislation that abolishes these leadership political action committees because um, in the House, I believe there, there were four or five uh, committee chairs that had leadership political action committees. These were uh, set up really as a way to funnel special interest money back into the system with no accountability. I'd like to see a, a gift ban because we need to restore public service to, to that, just to being a public servant, not feathering one's nest. And if you look at Governor Haley's disclosure, uh, she had, I believe, over $130,000 in gifts uh, during her first term, uh, everything from jewelry to luxury uh, suite uh, for football games uh, on down the line. And so why should public officials be getting uh, thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars in gifts? This, this needs to be banned. And finally, I'd like to see, um, we mentioned income disclosure. I think that's an important uh, element of, of any uh, ethics bill, but certainly an independent investigative body for <coughs> investigating ethics complaints. That's so critical because as we know and as we've seen, uh, the House and Senate ethics committees are sitting in judgment of their peers. That has not worked. Uh, it's, it's, and I was pleased to see that uh, uh, Speaker uh, Lucas said that he doesn't really want the House taking up uh, these kind of ethics complaints in the future. So we need an independent investigative body, and uh, the sooner the better because the system is broken. And uh, we need to uh, drain the swamp of corruption in Columbia. Very sadly, uh, it's been widely reported that there is an ongoing uh, investigation again. Now, we lived through lost trust back in the 80s, and uh, so the potential is there again to see a number of public officials indicted uh, because we uh, have uh, this, uh, this systematic corruption in state government. That's got to change. The public has to have confidence in our state government. So we've got to restore trust and confidence. Uh, otherwise, uh, we're going to have uh, more and more cynicism on the part of voters, a lack of participation, and we've got to turn that trend around so that people can have faith and trust in our government again and our elected officials. Um, let me just jump in since you were just talking about the systemic corruption in state government. Um, did you see anything in the whole situation with the Harold case um, that caused you concerns about the judiciary? There is a concern, and, and that's the vote trading allegations. Uh, we, uh, <clears throat> you know, of course, we'll await the uh, findings of the investigation that I understand is ongoing, mm -hmm. but it is of concern, uh, and there's no perfect way to elect judges. Um, as you know, South Carolina and Virginia are the only two states that allow their General Assembly to elect our judiciary. Um, and so I would be open to looking at uh, that process if uh, someone can convince me there's a better way. But the best way, obviously, is to elect uh, public officials with integrity uh, so that we don't have this uh, vote trading. Uh, there's a statute against it. Uh, and um, so we, we need elected officials who are willing to follow the law. And if they're not, they should be voted out of office or limited uh, by term limits. Um, since this is a little different kind of race, um, we understand why you think, uh, from what you, from a lot of what you've gone through, um, that you'd be a better governor than Governor Haley. Why would you be a better governor than Senator Shaheen? Senator Shaheen is, has failed to, to lead as well. You know, he, you know, he brought up the Confederate flag 33 days before the general election, uh, a very divisive issue. And um, I think uh, most people saw through that as, as political pandering because uh, Senator Shaheen has never introduced legislation to, to uh, move the Confederate flag. 
Uh, he's never spoken on the issue. In fact, when he was asked about it in 2010, uh, he said something to the effect that, well, I'd be willing to have a conversation about it. So why, uh, why would he bring that issue up uh, a month before the general election, uh, other than just for political uh, reasons? Uh, obviously, if, if that was important to him, he should have been out front leading uh, on that issue. Uh, and there have been other instances. Uh, I mentioned the ethics uh, bill earlier. Uh, you know how the legislative process works. It's not perfect. We have to take uh, incremental uh, improvements when we can. And so I fault Senator Shaheen for not, not supporting the income disclosure bill. At least that would have been some improvement over what we have now. And to say that it's not perfect, well, you could say that about any legislation. And so he's failed to lead on ethics. And uh, he's, been, he's been in the General Assembly too long. 14 years uh, is a, a long time, and I think the longer the legislators are here, uh, the more affected they are by special interests, uh, political party bosses, and cronyism. Um, under what circumstances do you believe that a governor should act in opposition to public opinion? And if you could, Give us some examples, if you have any, of when you have done that. Well, uh, leadership does require courage, and it requires uh, doing the right thing when it's not always popular. And so I've done that already in my infrastructure plans. Mm -hmm. uh, I've, I've advocated a gas tax increase. That's not popular, but it's the right thing to do. It's a responsible thing to do because our infrastructure is crumbling. And it's the conservative thing to do because it's a core function of state government to, to uh, make sure that we have safe roads and bridges. And so uh, I'm leading on that issue when no one else will. Uh, Governor uh, Haley has no plan to improve our roads and bridges. She did say at one point that she had a secret plan, but she wouldn't tell us what it was until after the election. Well, that's, that's clearly not leadership. Uh, Governor Shaheen, has a plan to rate our general fund to pay for road maintenance. That's no plan either because the money's not there. Uh, we need the general fund to, to support public education, mental health, uh, programs for our elderly and our seniors, and on down the line. And to, to pit uh, all the good programs that we have uh, to help people that are in need against road maintenance, that's not leadership. So uh, they've avoided the tough issue of how to fix our infrastructure. I have not. Can you, um, can you think of any examples where, as you have come to study and, and better understand an issue, you have changed your position on it? Yes. Um, at one time, um, I thought that when you look at criminal sentencing, that um, my, my attitude early on was lock them up and throw away the key. But I've, I've come to realize um, in, in my career as a circuit judge and as a nonprofit leader after that, working through United Way and the Community Foundation, uh, that we need to reserve our prison beds for the most violent offenders. And so where we are dealing with nonviolent offenders, it's better uh, to uh, have community-based uh, corrections so that they can be monitored in community and, and so that they can work in alternative sentencing uh, by doing public service and probation uh, and be continue to be a productive member of society because it's so costly to incarcerate. And South Carolina, unfortunately, over the years has, has led the nation in our rate of incarceration. And, and that's changed a little bit, but it needs to change more because uh, the, the cost of incarcerating uh, nonviolent offenders is, is really uh, a hidden tax. We could save a lot of tax money if we uh, went back and tried to improve our community-based correction system. Things like intensive probation and electronic monitoring and drug testing, those are very effective programs, and they save a lot of taxpayer money. What, um, if anything, as governor, could you do or would you want to do to try to make more space for um, elected officials 
to change their positions as they come to understand different ways of looking at issues? Well, I think it's an educational process, and, uh, and I'll give you an example. Uh, uh, on the issue recently of medical marijuana, uh, you know, I, uh, I think that the knee-jerk reaction by, by most legislators was, well, we don't want that in South Carolina. But I, I commend uh, Senator Tom Davis for educating uh, the public and the General Assembly by uh, bringing forward the, the young child that had this seizure disorder and pointing out that uh, this can be a medical benefit uh, and it can be done safely and under a doctor's supervision. And that child has been helped. And so that, that's leadership. That's an educational process where we learn something mm -hmm. and uh, we can help a child. And, and there are others out there that can be helped by medical marijuana, if, as, uh, as we've seen in the medical literature. And so uh, that's part of the process of leadership is, is, uh, is educating not only the public, but the General Assembly. Mm -hmm. What, um, are there additional powers that the governor's office needs? You know, I, I don't think so. I, I think that um, we have seen governors in the past who've been great leaders. For example, uh, Dick Riley uh, led us in public education, and, and, and he, he, he made great strides in improving public education. Uh, Carol Campbell uh, made great strides in improving our infrastructure. Uh, he advocated the gas tax 27 years ago. That's the last time it was adjusted. And he also uh, led in the area of economic development when he brought uh, BMW to the upstate. And that created a whole chain of events that uh, led us to diversify our industrial base. We've moved from a, uh, a textile economy to a modern manufacturing economy through Carol Campbell's leadership. So these are two examples of how a governor can lead. And so uh, I don't buy the fact that we necessarily have to increase the governor's powers. What we need is leadership. That's what we need in South Carolina. And we don't have it right now. Um, are, what, if any, changes would you make to the relationship between state and local government? You know, there's so many unfunded mandates um, for local governments. And um, I, I saw this when I was town attorney for my little hometown of Honeypath um, years ago. And I, I attended uh, municipal association meetings, and I'm familiar with the issues that are faced by counties as well. And it puts them in a really tough spot when the General Assembly cuts aid to subdivisions. And what does that do? It really is a cost shift and it forces local governments to cut services and increase taxes. And that's not fair. And Governor Haley's been the worst offender, and I'll tell you why. Because she has failed to lead on infrastructure, so many counties around the state have had to pass local option sales taxes just to fix their state highways and their infrastructure. So um, she, she may claim to be a tax cutter, but she's been a tax increaser. And that, there's a referendum pending in my home county of Greenville uh, on November the 4th to raise the sales tax. Everything that we buy by 1%, in order, including groceries, by the way, in order to pay for road funding and maintenance of state highways. And that's a state responsibility. But she shifted that cost to local government, and that's not right. I, um, I have um, plenty more questions, but I think we are down to less than 15 minutes, so I want to see if anyone, uh, Warren, I'll start with you, do you have questions? Mm -hmm. and, and we'll come back to me if you want. Jamie, come on up to the table and join us. Great. Yes, I have.
favor with the legislature and be an effective governor and leader when you present some idea like that to them? I mean, what's your what's your strategy for, for presenting? Well, that? obviously, um, incumbent legislators are going to be the last ones to to buy into term limits. We know that, and and uh, your question's uh, a good one. It has to come from the grassroots. It has to come from a, a, a movement of public that is just so dissatisfied with business as usual. And with, uh, let's face it, with, with what we've got now, and that is uh, a swamp of corruption. And um, so what's it going to take? Uh, it, another round of uh, indictments, uh, another round of um, uh, l legislators who, who have, have failed us, who failed to lead. And, and I think the public is ready. I've, I've talked uh, with folks as we travel around the state at these town halls, and, and there's tremendous support for term limits. And it's not a perfect solution, but um, as one editorial writer recently said, it may be uh, the only solution to this problem. And uh, um, I, I hope that we can str pass a strong ethics bill uh, with all the elements that we discussed earlier. Uh, but if we can't, I think there's going to be even greater support for term limits. So uh, the pressure is on, and the General Assembly is going to have to respond. And, and they feel the pressure as well. They know it's out there. So it's a grassroots effort. That's what it will take. Um, did you have any other questions, Jenny? Right. The, um, I want to talk a little bit about effectiveness. Um, most traditionally governors come to office first of all with with party backing with, right. with with a certain number of members in the legislature of their party feeling like they have to at least initially support them um, you're not you would not bring any of that so talk and and although you have served in the legislature it's been a long time what are there five people maybe still there who were there with you um, talk to us about how you would get anything done with this legislature? I, I see my independence as a real plus, and I'll tell you why. Uh -huh. um, <clears throat> unfortunately, what, what have party politics brought us? They've brought us gridlock, finger pointing, and no solutions. And so um, my work as a judge uh, trained me to listen to all sides of, of a problem and come up with common sense solutions. My work as a mediator did the same thing, to build common ground, to realize that uh, there's always more than, than one side uh, to an issue, and, and so what you have to do is build common ground. I know how to do that, and that's called leadership. I will lead the General Assembly, and, I, and it's building uh, relationships, and, and uh, I'm good at that, and uh, that's what it takes uh, to, to pass a legislative agenda. So when I walk into the room with the Republican caucus, I'm not going to be viewed as a, an outsider necessarily or the enemy. Uh, same thing is true when I walk into the House Republican Caucus. I'm not, I will not be viewed as the enemy. Uh, I'm, I'm nonpartisan. And there's so many people in South Carolina that have responded to that message that I'm independent and that I really want to solve problems. And that's what we need in South Carolina. We, the last thing we need is, is a, a partisan governor uh, like we have now in Governor Haley that wants to politicize every issue that comes along. And it's not served our state well, and it doesn't serve our people well. What have we not addressed that you want to make sure we do address? Well, again, it's all about leadership. And <clears throat> we, we're at a critical stage in South Carolina. Uh, the good news is that, that um, in the coming legislative year, we have an opportunity to pass a strong ethics bill. And, and the General Assembly is ready to do it, and with leadership, they will do it, I believe. Same thing is true with infrastructure. They realize that time has come to bite the bullet and fix our crumbling infrastructure. If we have a governor who will lead, Nikki Haley will not. She's already told us she's going to veto any attempt at a gas tax or fee increase. Vincent Shaheen will not. He's already told us he wants to raid the general fund, and he's opposed to any, any effort to raise fees or, or the gas tax. Um, it's the only responsible way to have a, a long-term 
reliable revenue stream to fix our infrastructure. If I'm there, I can get infrastructure passed. If I'm governor, I will get an ethics bill passed. And if we don't, I'm going to turn the heat up on term limits because the people, will ba they will back me up on that. They are ready to back me up on that. And I would prefer to do both. But I'm going to use term limits as, uh, as a threat that if this ethics thing, this ethics mess and the corruption is not repaired, we're going to go straight to the people with term limits. And that is the way to get it done. Because these, these uh, career politicians fear term limits. They don't, they don't want to go there. But they will pass a strong ethics bill, provided we have leadership. And that's what I'm going to offer the people of our state. One question I will ask you. Yes, sir. Um, you, you questioned Mr. Shaheen's timing on, on raising the I do. I do. Federal yes, sir. Um, when will be the, a, a good time to raise that issue again, or do you think it's been settled? You know, <clears throat> I'd, I'd like to uh, solve the problems we've talked about today first. Uh, you know, they're critical priorities uh, for our state. Uh, the flag is a symbol, and for some, it's a symbol of oppression. Uh, for others, it's a symbol of heritage and states' rights. That's a divisive issue. And so the last thing I want to do is begin my administration dividing people. I want to unite people. As we talked earlier, we need to build common ground to solve our problems. And so the, the flag uh, is way down my priority list. I would, I would uh, uh, visit that only after we've passed our uh, agenda of reform. That, that's what's, that, those are the critical needs of our state. We've got to fix infrastructure, ethics, and we've got to do something to grow the economy for all because uh, in certain parts of our state, in the rural counties, they are still suffering. In Governor Haley's own home county of Bamberg, we have a 13.3% unemployment rate. And you go around the rural areas of our state, and they're suffering. The industry has not come there. And, you know, I'll give you a perfect example. Back in 2010, if you go to my website, trustintom.com, you can view this video. During the 2010 gubernatorial debate, both Governor Haley and Vincent Shaheen promised the voters of our state that they would build Interstate 73. They promised that they would. And guess what? We have no Interstate 73. So they have failed to lead. That's a promise that was broken. And they're making other promises now. And so the voters need to look at that video. Go back and look at it and see there was no equivocation on the part of Nikki Haley or Vince Shaheen. We're going to build Interstate 73. And you know what? It could have been built. That's the sad thing because Governor Haley had the perfect opportunity when the stimulus bill uh, for infrastructure passed in Washington to take federal money to build that interstate and she refused to do it for political reasons. And it would have grown the economy from the PD all the way to the coast. It would open a corridor for tourism. And I honestly don't know if we'll have another opportunity to build that interstate. I hope we do because uh, a recent study showed that economic development happens around interstates. And, and, and so that was a missed opportunity again. Why? Politics. And we're going to be talking next Monday, uh, next Tuesday about uh, uh, coverage expansion. And this is the last thing I'd like to cover with you. Uh, and that is uh, how Governor Haley failed our state, again, for political purposes. Now, let me say, I don't like Obamacare. I think it's flawed legislation. And it needs to be either repealed or fixed by Congress. But the Supreme Court said it's the law of the land. So what did she do? She left billions of our own taxpayer dollars on the table to go to some other state, not to be saved. This money's going to some other state to benefit their uninsured people. And like Chris Christie, a Republican governor in Jersey said, he said, I'd rather have my citizens going to, to be treated by their family doctor with coverage instead of going to the emergency room without coverage, because we all know what happens when you have to treat uh, the uninsured in the ER. The bill gets passed onto the taxpayers, or it gets passed onto those of us that are fortunate enough to have health insurance through increased premiums, which is another hidden tax. So what did Governor Haley do? 
She left billions of our own tax dollars on the table for political purposes so she could bash Obama. And then to, she missed the opportunity for 44,000 new high paying jobs in our state. The University of South Carolina study documented that had we gone with coverage expansion, we could have created 44,000 new high paying jobs in the healthcare industry. Nurses, doctors, anesthesiologists, technicians. And we had 14 rural counties in South Carolina that lost money last year and one that went bankrupt. And there's several now in dire need of help. This money could have helped uh, solidify their financial position as rural hospitals. And as these rural hospitals fail, we're going to have a, a terrible health care crisis in our rural areas because those citizens will not have access at all, not even to the emergency room. Not only will they not have coverage, they will not even have an emergency room where those, where those rural hospitals fail. And the final point, and the most important of all, is we could have helped some 300,000, 300,000 South Carolinians, most of whom are working poor and middle class, have coverage. And she missed, she gave up that opportunity for political reasons, and that is wrong. So when I'm governor, I'm going to ask the General Assembly to reconsider that decision. And as long as the federal money is 100 percent, uh, we should take advantage so that we can grow our economy for all, help our rural hospitals, expand coverage, get those 300,000 people covered, and create those jobs that were left on the table. And as we go forward, if our economy grows, hopefully we can, uh, we can find a way to continue that coverage. Uh, if our economy stagnates and we don't have the money, we'll have to set priorities. We can cut back. But it's, it, there are three, three years, the first three years, as you know, was 100%. Of, we've already lost two of those. We've lost two of those years, so we've got that one year left. And I think that what you'll see is uh, there will be a policy change in Washington. I'm, I'm predicting that they will... Uh, they will probably uh, extend uh, the funding. But, and, and if not, they will work with individual states. There are a number of states that are already working with Washington to fashion their own solution. And that's what we should have done in South Carolina. We had that opportunity, uh, and we have missed it. So uh, we've got to dig out of that hole, uh, another Haley hole that's been created. But uh, it can be done. It's not too late. And, and we can still revisit that issue with leadership, responsible leadership.